seguir enfrentando un poco el teatro irlandés, es decir, y además, no solamente en Chile escucharlo y verlo, sino que tuvimos oportunidad de verlo representar como lo he hecho anoche también aquí. Yo, lamentablemente, anoche no los he podido acompañar, pero sí he disfrutado mucho de esa presentación que se hizo en Chile. Por lo tanto, tenerlo nuevamente acá creo que es un privilegio y es un enriquecimiento indudable que uno tiene sobre todo su sapiencia y que es la vuelca aquí. Así que bueno, nada, dejo con esto de alguna manera. Eh, no estoy hablando de algo que tendría que leerlo, pero sí conozco su currículum y ustedes lo conocen mejor que nadie. Así que estoy hablando de alguien que es mucho más conocido para ustedes todavía de lo que uno supone. Así que bueno, quedan con Denis. Gracias. Buenos días a todos. Y hoy en día tengo que ir y todos, ¿no? Me confunde mucho. Bueno, pues eh, dar las gracias a Justin, a Paula, a Verónica y, y todo el equipo que han organizado eso y invitarme porque es un placer estar aquí. Um, ¿Cómo presentar el pasado? hoy en día en el escenario. ¿Cómo podremos recuperar, recuperar eventos históricos del pasado o gente, personajes? ¿Y hasta qué punto podremos presentarlos de una manera que nos pueda dar algo, incluirnos, o por bien o por el mal? Porque presentar una obra sobre Hitler también tiene su lado de contrapunto de que lo que es eh, la maldad. Entonces, eso es mi propuesta hoy, eh, haciendo relación también con Amigos Nebrija, la obra que hice ayer. Entonces, esta mañana no hablo como un sable todo ni un académico, pero hablo de lo que me siento, lo que me siento como artista y como persona que está, como todos, intentando enfrentarnos con la verdad, con las emociones. Estamos en una época, una edad en que las emociones están cada día menos tomadas en cuenta. Y hay un, mu un muro que está subiendo poco a poco. Entonces me pregunté, ¿y qué? ¿Por qué? La gente va a escuchar lo que yo tengo que decir. Cada uno de nosotros tenemos algo que decir. Y por eso espero que mis experiencias personales, mi punto de vista personal, pueda ser por lo menos una gota dentro del charco de emociones que ha existido desde tiempos de las cuevas. Para empezar, voy a leer unos versos que estaban escritos sobre una eh, lápida hace eh, 2.700 años eh, en, eh, en un pequeño cementerio espartano en, en Grecia. Eh, dicen que fue escrito por el poeta griego Alcman eh, y, y des, describen, explican una noche espartano hace 2700 años. Y dice, ahora duermen las cumbres grandes, las sierras y los barrancos, los torrentes y los arroyos. Ahora duermen las laboriosas abejas y las fieras y bestias de las tierras altas. Duerme todo lo que anda o se arrastra alimentando por la negra noche. Duermen los monstruos de los abismos del mar oscuro y reluciente y las tribus de las aves que abrían sus largas alas a la noche. ¿Cuántos siglos de oscuridad tendrán que pasar hasta que volvamos a ver la luz? ¿Cuántos ríos habrá que llenar con sangre hasta que el hombre distinga la verdad? ¿Cuántos niños, mujeres inocentes deberán morir hasta que la bondad cubra la tierra? 
¿Qué deberemos esperar antes de que las lágrimas hunden el suelo que pisamos? Parad, parad y pensad, pensad, pensad. Esa, esos versos tienen una historia. Antes de todo, la primera parte es de Altman. La segunda parte es mío. Y lo escribí cuando estuve dirigiendo Ajax de Sófocles. Y es el final de la obra. Y está en la boca de un personaje que dice que se llama Calcas. Es el divino. Entonces, con estos versos muestro que el hombre, la historia del mundo, es universal. ¿Y qué significa universal? Es que cual, para cualquier país, para cualquier nación, sea chino, japonés, ucranio, rusia, irlandés, argentina, español, sentimos como humanos los mismos sentimientos y surgen las mismas ideas. Entonces aproveché las palabras escritas hasta 2700 años para inspirarme a dar el final de la, de la muerte de, de Ajax, un guerrero. Entonces, empezando de este punto de vista, vemos que en realidad el autor o la persona que está escribiendo sobre personalidades y hechos tiene que primero entrar en los sentimientos de aquel tiempo. Tiene que vivir dentro del cuerpo de los personajes. Y hacer eso es el reto del autor, director, actor, que quiere, quiere presentar en el escenario el pasado. Otro ejemplo que me gustaría apuntar es de Shakespeare. Hablan de Shakespeare cuando murió su hijo Hamnet, él estaba en Londres. Decían que en realidad no se sentía mucho o no se sentía nada o sentía mucho. Entonces, ¿cómo podremos saber exactamente qué había sentido Shakespeare cuando murió su hijo Hamnet? Hamnet, el nombre, no tiene nada que ver con la obra Hamlet. Es decir, que no está usando Hamlet como ejemplo para Hamlet. Hamnet fue un nombre conocido. El niño tenía 12 años. Entonces, yo me fui a las obras de Shakespeare. The, uh, my speech is supposed to be in English, I've just realized. Uh, 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 are you sure? What will I do, Justin? Will I change and give it in English? Because maybe people are listening in English, are they? What do you think, Justin? I can, I can, you know, I can wear another sombrero. Well, so, but, well a, lot of my, a lot of my quotes will be in English. So I went to his, his works, and there are two particular points in Shakespeare's work, which I think are referential to... Ahora estoy hablando en inglés. Entonces, que me hacía sentir lo que él. Uno es... Uno de sus sonetas, el número 33. Y hay una, unos versos ahí que dicen, Even so, my son, one early morn did shine with all triumphant splendor on my brow. But out, alack, he was but one hour mine. The region cloud that mastered from me now. Entonces la palabra son tiene dos sentidos. En el escrito es S-U-N, el sol, pero también está relacionado con el hijo. Y otro gran momento en Shakespeare donde se muestra de una manera increíble la profundidad del sentimiento del rey Lear a la muerte de Cordelia. Cuando entra... Diciendo, howl, 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 all oh, your men of stones. And I, your tongues and eyes, I'd use them so that heaven's walls would crack. She's gone forever. 
she's dead as earth. Lend me a looking glass. If that our breaths should mist or stain the stone, why then she lives. This feather stirs, she lives. If it is so, it is a gift beyond relief. No, never, 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 never shall come no more. Para mí, eso es las lágrimas de un padre por la muerte de una hija. ¿Y cómo no puedo reproducir eso 500 años después? Cuando esas palabras son universales que me pueden tocar al alma. ¿Y sabes como actor, cómo me entré en este personaje? Voy a sorprender, porque la creatividad es un incógnito. Nunca se sabe cuándo la mus va a entrar y decir, Espera un momento, yo tengo una idea. La idea fue Tarzán. El momento en que... Hola, ¿quién quiere ayudarme? Porque no hay jirafas, hay solamente jirafas, ¿verdad? Hay gorilas y gorilos. No, tampoco. Entonces es su madre, la gorilla, la gorila, es su madre, la gorila. Muy bien. Entonces su madre, la gorila, Yerde su criado. Y yo pensaba en Lear como el gorila, que está por encima, como el, el animal, está diciendo, es un instinto animal, es una pasión profunda. Entonces, esta posibilidad de transmitir emociones es lo que estoy buscando para reproducir el pasado. Ahora, hablando sobre el proceso, porque no se puede sentarte un día y decir, mira, voy a escribir sobre Elio Antonio de Nebrija. Eso es, tienes que investigar mucho. Y tuve que buscar en su vida... El momento clave, como podría ser lo de uh, Shakespeare, y el momento clave para mí fue aquel poema que, que hice ayer, Salve Casita Mía. Y había una palabra ahí, peonza, spinning top. And I thought, a spinning top. I can see this child, and he's playing with a spinning top. And I entered into him that way. So I was trying to awaken my emotions. Uh, I was trying to come to grips with the personaje from the end as a friend. I had to walk with him. I could only walk with him by following his footsteps. His footsteps. So I went to the place where he was born and I sat on a hill and looked out and thought how we would have felt at that moment. I walked through the streets of Salamanca, where he would have walked. The old, the uh, ancient cathedral there is the place he would have studied. And there's a street coming up from the old Roman bridge called Los Libreros, where they had all the bookshops. And I walked along there. Gradually, and this is the mystery of the artist, It's a, these are mystery, psychological mystery, I suppose, of anybody, because we are all artists in one way or another. That you open yourself and it will come. When I went to the Roman theater in Merida, which I'm sure many of you have seen, the first time I went in there to direct was with Midsummer Night's Dream. I went in and I felt I was going back in the past and I felt that I could not barge in and say, here I am, I'm going to direct Shakespeare, I'm going to direct Midsummer Night's Dream, get out of my way, I want the lights here, I want that there, I want the actors there, no. The spirits of the past are there, I think. There is so much mystery about life, about people, about thought, so many things. And we've, we've spent so much, many centuries trying to understand that. But at the end of the day, it's what our own instinct matters. We instinctively know the difference between good and bad. Most people do. 
So I went in and I walked through the theater alone and I felt the columns and I asked for permission to put on my performances there. That's exactly what I was doing when I was trying to come to Nebrika. I began to hear his voice. How did I hear his voice? I mean, you could say, well, did he talk fast? Did he talk slow? Did he have a high voice? No, I was looking for the essence of what he was saying. And the essence of what he was saying is in what he wrote. Just as Shakespeare, the essence of what he felt was in what he wrote. So I tried to get his voice to link with mine. When an actor is performing, um, he shouldn't put on a voice. He shouldn't say, oh, uh, Iago is evil. So I'm going to talk evil like Iago. Or he shouldn't be Richard III and say, oh, I'm I, I, very pleased to meet you all, but I'm going to kill you all before the play is finished. <laughs> no, he has to let that voice be part of him because we are all evil inside in one way or another. We can all do terrible things. We can all love, we can also hate. Many of the men who committed atrocities in Yugoslavia during that war uh, were in fact doctors, professors, and people who had everyday life. And uh, the same is happening in Ukraine, which we will come to later on as well. So I became friends with Nabrika. I started to share his life. I started to feel his moments of happiness, his doubts, I began to realize what he would have felt when he was drawn out of university in Salamanca and the victories he had too. And I had to live with his, with his mistakes. I then had to look at the structure. So we're talking about presenting something from the past in the present. How can I identify with an audience so that they will follow what I'm saying and that it will seem real how can I be true to the past? In the case of Amicus Nabrika, uh, I had to first of all decide on the structure. I was asked to do Amicus Nabrika by the Quinto Centenario, La Comisión de la Quinto Centenario de Nabrika. And I was sitting in a square in Spain, wonderful Ciudad Rodrigo near Salamanca. And this person who represented the commission said to me, Dennis, he says, I'd like you to write a play about Amicus Nabrika. And I said, who was, uh, about Nebrija? And I said, who was Nebrija? And he said, he did, and he started to explain to me. I said, I know nothing about him, except that it appears that he was the founder of the Spanish language. Now, do you think that I am capable of doing a play about the founder of the Spanish language, Castellan? Me, with the accent I have, with my mistakes in grammar, with general. And he said, we've seen your plays on Santa Teresa, Vicente Ferrer, La Guerra de la Independencia, uh, Quixote, Cervantes, and we've seen you also produce plays. We think you will give an interesting mirada. And that was how it started. But I decided that I couldn't possibly perform as Nebrija. I mean, how could I come on stage and say, you know, Buenos dias, soy Elio Antonio de Nebrija. I have recognized over the years of working in Spain, and this is very important, that my, that you should use your disadvantages to your advantage. Be what you are. And don't cover that up. So I am what I am. And therefore, I could look at Nebrija with a very objective opinion, and I decided on the monologue. Now, how did I come to the conclusion that the monologue, the central character, should be an Irishman? Well, historically, the Irish were always related with Sal Salamanca in Colegio Fonseca. So we could, I could I, I create a fictitious character who would be a friend of Nebrija. Then I had to think about tone how I would come on with the story. Would it be strong, but it should be human. 
I feel, felt it should be loving. I felt it should be friendly. I felt it should have humility. I felt that it should be clear. I felt that it should be varied. And the principal thing was the idea, the intention. I wasn't interested in sound. The sound will come. I'm interested in the intention. Because the intention is the idea that is projected to your intention. I don't want you to agree with me, but I do want you to walk in my head. I want to do this together because there are three energies in theater, the author, the actor, and the public. You are an actor also. So I want you to be in my head. How do you do that? It's called stage presence. How do you do that? You risk the silence for one thing. You take that pause that makes you a bit disquiet, a bit wondering, has he forgotten the lines? Because in our heart, we're all like in the Colosseum, the Rome, you know, we're all waiting for the lines to come in or the gladiator. There's something of us in that. So when I take a long pause, has he forgotten his lines? What's he going to do next? But I have your attention. And the pause and the tone is terribly important in presence, in bringing your mind into mind. Of course, I submerged myself in the text of Nebrik. Now, what I'm saying to you now, I'm going to stop talking about Nebrik in a little while. And just so that you won't say to yourself, oh God, he's going to talk again about Nebrik. And then we saw the show last night, so we don't want to know any more. But what I'm going to do later on is I'm going to adapt the process I'm talking about now to uh, um, two characters in the history that had importance to South America in one way or another. And I'm going to approach that with the same basis that I have here with new inspirations, with new ideas. And I will explain how I might stage those and I did this in the last month or so. So it's not for staging, it's just for a first taste of what it might be. Um, the other point, of course, is how do you handle the other personajes? You know, I was doing last night the Queen, I was doing the Bricha, I was doing Diego de Deza, I was doing various personalities. Now, again, you can caricature those, but I didn't do much on the Queen except to give a little sense of of a stature, a little sense of dignity, a little change in the tone to show that. Let me give you an example. Juliet, I could play Juliet. You could play Lear. You could play Hamlet. What would your approach be? My approach is to look for the femininity that we all have, male, male have, or the masculinity that we, a woman might have, because there is that division between the two. So Juliet to me would be, uh, wouldn't be, oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore I be. That's terrible. It would be, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name, or if no, will not be what sworn my love and I'll no longer be a Capulet. Because the essence of what Juliet is saying is a 14 year old girl in love thinking and trying to make that break from, from childhood to young woman. And that is the key to Juliet. So I'm going to jump a little onto what I said earlier on because I don't want to Take too much of your time when there are so many other things happening. And I tend to lose sense of time when I'm talking about this subject, theatre. But I will do a little bit of Hamlet for you. And to be or not to be, ser or no ser. Why will I do that? Because when I was at a con congress on Nebri, and I was surrounded by academics and Latin scholars from all over the world, I asked them, how can I compete 
with so many Latin scholars who know so much more than I do about Latin and the Greek and everything else. And um, I listened to one of them who gave us whole Bonincia in Latin. Yeah. And I said to him afterwards, I said, I would love to hear Mark Antonio address the people of Rome in Latin. Because Latin is a very concise language. And in very few words, you can tell a lot. And uh, I said to him, for example, I think it would have the impact. For example, listen to to be or not to be. Because to be or not to be almost has the impact of Latin because it's so economic. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of trouble and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, to is a consummation devoutly to be wished to die, to sleep. Sleep. The chance to dream, ay, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. So again, the tonal quality, the difference in language. You make that language work for you the way your thoughts and the emotions deep down are there. I sometimes speak languages on the stage and I don't know what I'm saying. No, like you can push a book on law, they shall put it there. Enfant, they shall shunt it on law. They stick and hack and hook and fuck and Bavarian my battle. Bayern Munich, Dusseldorf. So you change the tone a little. Now, I'm going to read a poem that was written in, I picked this up in Georgia. It was given to me as a present. I mean, a book with this in it. And it's about love. Because the two most important things when you approach the past and when you approach life is love and death. Love incorporates just about everything. Because you have the hate as well. But love is the most important thing in the relationship between the humans. And that love can be expressed about different things, about your country. Very often nationalism is talking about love, but in fact it's not. It's talking about revenge or it's talking about other things. But this is a poem called Suli. And it is about love and it's from Georgian because we don't need to just look at Shakespeare we don't need to look at uh, English authors or Spanish authors for inspiration Eastern Europe is an example to us nowadays of understanding what death is and what love is and to a certain extent the West Western Europe and that have become too complacent in our understanding of what words are and what they mean and what they should mean this is it, it's called Shuliko. In vain, I sought my loved one's grave. Despair plunged me in deepest woe. Overwhelmed with bursting sobs, I cried, O oh, where art thou, my Shuliko? In solitude upon a bush, a rose in loveliness did grow. With downcast eyes, I softly asked, Perchance tis thou, O oh, Shuliko? The flower trembled in a sense as low it bent its lovely head. On its blushing cheek there shone tears that in the morning skies had shed. Its rustling leaves a nightingale was singing to the rose below. I hailed the bird and gently asked, perchance is thou, O Suliko? The songster fluttered nearer to the rose and on it pressed a kiss, disburdening its soul in song that breathed of ecstasy. And bliss. A twinkling star shed shimmering light upon me in a silver glow. I turned to it and whispered low, perchance is thou, O Suliko. 
As I gazed upon the star that shone in light that glimmered bright and clear, a gentle breeze came passing by and stopped to whisper in my ear, what thou dost seek is found at last. Henceforth thy heart what calm will know. The night will bring thee sweet repose and day will chase away thy woe. Thy sulaco was changed into a nightingale, a star and rose. Your souls that true bound as one to realms divine in heaven's rose. I seek no more my loved one's grave, no more do I in sorrow weep. The world no longer hears me sigh, nor sees me drowned in anguish deep. None can express the bliss I feel to hear the nightingale from far, to breathe the essence of the rose and gaze upon the shining star. My bosom throbs once more in joy. No more am I oppressed by woe. I seek no tomb, for now I see thy dwellings three, my Shuliko. Now that is an introduction to that very tragic person in Argentinian history, Camilo Ogor. Now, somebody asked me to write a play about Camilo Ogor. They haven't asked me, but I, I'm imagining, like just as with Nebrika. Now, where do you start? I went the last time I was here to her in the cemetery of Recoleta and saw her tomb, which, which was rather uncared for and it was rather cold and it was rather dark and it was rather much more emphasis was given to the great heroes of war and, and uh, sport even. But Camilo was there and I thought a lot about her. And that poem, to a certain extent, is an introduction to love. So how would I stage I mean, the obvious thing is to go, so herself and her lover are sitting there. And I, I imagine that's first touch, you know, like they've just started and they just don't know each other hardly anymore. That's just, just touch of hand maybe and suddenly they become embarrassed. And then it leads on and the next time they start to pour out their heart and so forth and so forth and so forth. And it leads to the disaster. But there's much more in the story of Camilla than love. She was this woman ahead of her time in many respects. She had to defend herself against the machoism of the time. She was, in fact, I thought that perhaps she was a victim of family honor too. And you, that's contemporary. That's happening. And it's happening in much more places than we might imagine. So I looked back a bit and then I had done a play some years previously in which I played the part of Peter Abelard. And that is another famous love story, Eloise and Abelard. And I don't know whether you know much about them, but it's 12th century. Peter was a great teacher, philosopher, and Eloise was a brilliant woman, way ahead of her time, feminist, although the expression wasn't Jewish then, and they fell in love. And she was more liberal in her attitude to love, much more liberal than Abelardo was. She almost, I found it a bit contradictory, she almost felt that marriage wasn't necessary if you're giving yourself as a woman that you give yourself totally and marriage is immaterial. But what interested me was the exchange of letters between the two of them, Abelardo and Eloise. And it went on all the life. Abelardo didn't have as tragic an end as Camilla's lover, uh, but almost because he was castrated by the uncle. So that was rather it didn't seem to affect the letters all that much, you know? I mean, in the long run, they continued their relationship. And it, it so happens that they both died at the same age. She was 16 when he met her, when she met him, and he was 20 years older. So there in itself is a story. Uh, they both died at the same age, 63. Uh, she reached the level of, of a bishop in in terms of 
uh, naves. So that's one influence. The other influence is Juliet in Romeo and Juliet. It's a different stage in the love relationship, young love. And as I quoted a little earlier, she's looking out from her balcony and she says, oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name, or if thou wilt not be what sworn my love and I'll no longer be a captain. It is but thy name that is my enemy. So, this is my concept. We forget about the lover. We put Camilla on stage waiting alone for the eventual tragic outcome of her existence. She doesn't know what's happened. I mean, she doesn't know why it's happened. It, it, she's in a situation that is inevitable. But she's trying to reason, was she right? Was she wrong? Should she have fallen in love? Did she betray her father? Did she betray her country? Did she betray her gender? And we need a defense or we need it. So we bring in Eloisa on stage. Eloisa comes on stage and we have a dialogue between the two about their personal situation, about the argument in favor or against what they represent as women. So we are now making universal a love story so that it will have some meaning nowadays for you and anybody else. Because nowadays theater is a force of strength that we mustn't neglect because it is one of the only ways we can maintain emotions. We transmit emotions. And perhaps the right people nowadays who should be seeing theatre are not seeing theatre. And also, there is a lot of superficiality in, the, in what people say about knowing theatre. And I must say, that includes a lot of politicians. They don't have time to go to the theatre. They don't support, and I'm speaking globally about this, they don't support the right projects. The right project is not, I don't want to abuse the fact that it, the, the El Rey Leon, but Rey Leon for me is very interesting. And I'm sure if I brought my grandchildren along, they'd love it. And I would love it too. But it's not the full effect that theater should have. Theater should make you cry or make you laugh, but certainly make you think. So in this debate between Camila and um, uh, Eloisa, I need a modern voice. So in comes Julia. So now we have a trio. I then thought, because I haven't expounded this any further, I then thought, who else can I bring in here? And nowadays, if you have more than four characters on stage, it costs a fortune and the producers won't put it on. You can't have a, a cast of seven people. And if you can double with, with two characters, if you can do all of Midsummer Night's Dream better still, because it doesn't cost as much money. That's what's happening with theater. So I, I was wondering whether I would bring in Ambrosio O'Higgins, not Bernardo, but Ambrosio O'Higgins, to give the male point of view, because here's an Irishman who left. And what happens to the Irish abroad very often? They are, they are um, inspired much more to do better left our country, if I'd stayed there, I'd be working on the farm or I'd be doing this. I'm talking a bit, you know, historically too. Uh, so I have to do well. I have to do well for my country. I have to do well for my family. And I have to do well for where I am now. I owe it to the country I've come to stay in to do well. So I might bring in Ambrosio. So that is my suggestion for Camilla. All I need now is about 100,000 pesetas or 100,000 euros, <laughs> and I'm staged. Uh, there's an interesting poem that Alexander Pope wrote, and I just quote a few verses for it, because it does explain also the feelings I have about putting on the play. He says, and he was referring to Abelard and Eloisa, such if there be who love so long, so well, let him 
are sad or tender story tell. The well-sung walls will soothe my pensive ghost. Think about Eloise. He best can paint him who can feel him most. That's the very point I'm making. I cannot project the personalities, the plays, the people, the past, unless I feel. Now, the second example is another tragic but heroic figure in our own history, Ireland, and in fact, in this relationship with uh, what he wrote about the Amazon, and that's Roger Keesman. Now, Roger Keesman, I mean, recently, Marcus Yossef has written the Celt stream, the dream of the Celt. And, uh, but I searched again, because this is not that, I, oh, I must do Keesman. No, it was South America theater, the cultural influence, 1922. All of those elements were coming into my mind. And I read about Ambrosio, and I left Ambrosio, but I went to Keesman. Now, I'd like to read something Yeats wrote about death, because we're now, we've done love, we're now on to death. And Kate, uh, Ocasey, uh, rather, Yeats wrote about death, nor dread, nor hope attend a dying hour. A man awaits his end, dreading and hoping all. Many times he died, many times rose again. A great man in his pride, confronting murderous men, cast derision upon supersession of breath. He knows death to the bone. Man has created death. Now, case, a caseman wrote a letter from Pentonville Prison to a man whom he had met, a Longford man. And the name of the man was Jack Kelly. He was a bookmaker and he was on his way to Mallow in County Cork. And he was waiting, this man, Jack Kelly, was waiting for his train at Limerick Junction. That's a train station in Ireland in April 1916. He was one of a few people on the platform when he saw a group of eight or 10 Royal Irish Constabulary. That's all I see. The police at that time, but we were still under British rule. And they were beating a handcuffed prisoner with their fists and rifle butts. So there was a prisoner handcuffed and they were beating with their rifle butts and their fists. Jack went and asked them to leave the prisoner in peace. This led to a brawl and Jack took out two or three of the policemen. He was arrested and they started beating him up. A British army officer intervened on this platform as well and he drew his pistol and he ordered the police to back off. And then he took Jack away and brought him to a nearby public house, he bought him a bottle of brandy. And then he, then he brought the rest of the brandy to the prisoner. And Jack later, Jack would intervene later, received a letter from the man, Roger Casey. And the letter went as follows. From Roger Casey to a man who had helped. My dear Mr. Kelly, I got your name from the policeman here at the prison. They've been most correct in their treatment of you. Not like our own Irish police force, who are akin to a bunch of savages. Now, I want to thank you and the British officer who came to my aid at Limerick Junction. As you may know from the papers, I've been sentenced to hang for so-called treason. I'm not afraid to die, to join Wolf Tone and Robert Emmett, and hope that my death may one day help to make my country free. I have no doubt in my mind that with men like your own good self, that will come to pass. I have also written to the young British officer to thank him, but have been told that he has returned to France. 
His name is Lieutenant Clark, the Royal Artillery. It's strange that the only kindness I received since my capture was from an Englishman and a Longford man. Goodbye, Mr. Kelly. We'll see you in heaven. God save Ireland. Yours very sincerely, Roger Casement. P.S. They have taken away my title, but I never wanted it. <laughs> love. That is kindness. That is honor. That a man will write a letter like that a few days before he's to hang is humanity. That is what interests me in Roger Casement. He later, later wrote a letter which I, I love uh, because, because the whole circumstances to his, to his cousin and he said, gee, I'm sure you know that. And he, he said this just a few days before he, he wrote. And it comes back with the nature I was speaking about, though, the influences, you know, 2,700 years ago, how feelings haven't changed. And he said, the other night I dreamt that you, G, and I were at Murloc Bay on the green hill, 900 feet above the sea coast to the McGarry's house, looking out at the racing tides of Moyle churning currents and whirlpools and overlapping tides and Alba across the way and the blue peaks of Jura clean and clear. A great panorama of island and hill and the swirling waters that first made me realize what Ireland was to me. And now I am on no hill with no waves to see or hear far off, with no sea but only the illimitable and no sea to gaze at. Death is not dark, but only deeper blue. Now, how would I stage that? There's my inspiration. What do I want to bring out? Honor, love, kindness, humanity. That's what I want to bring out. That's what we need to know and understand nowadays. So where do I stage? No, I'm not going to put Roger Casement on stage. I don't think always greatness can be personified on a stage. I will go to the Pope. I will put Jack down. And I'll put the British officer. And they'd be having a conversation. Now, remember 1916, the British officer went back to France. I don't know what happened to him, but all probability, he may have died. But there we have a situation that is open to different thought. A British officer who is defending what he believes is his empire, his country, his right to be in Ireland. And that's the way he's been brought up. That's his social station in life. But he goes beyond that in a human situation. And Jack, who later on apparently became a gun runner. And there's difference of opinion. But there is where they can talk. They can discuss. Because if we go around saying we are right all the time, we'll get nowhere with anybody. And that's where I would stage it that conversation in the pub between the two of them. Where it will lead to, what will come out, I don't know at this stage. But I have the dramatic structure and I have the dramatic impact and I have where I can show truth. Those are the two episodes that interest me. I'd just like to try and move on and I don't know how my time is, but we are in a situation nowadays when we have a terrible war on in Ukraine. And I'm not going to do a play about it, but I do want to understand about it. I want us to understand the nature of the Ukrainians and I want to understand how they feel. So I went to their, the father of their language, Taras Shevchenko. I don't know whether you know him or not, but you should read his book. He's the Shakespeare of Ukrainian. And I'd like to read a few poems of his so that you too will perhaps understand what it means nowadays to be 
defending your country, defending your people. I walk through the supermarkets in Madrid now, I walk through the streets in Madrid and I look around and I say to myself, Kiev was like this six months ago. People were walking in the street, were buying in the supermarket, were sitting outside cafes, and it's all changed. He wrote this called The Dream. It's fairly philosophical, not particularly nationalistic, but interesting. It says, have no envy for the rich man, for he never knows naught of friendship nor of love. He must hire all those. Have no envy for the mighty, for he must compel. Have no envy for the famous, for he knows full well that it is not him men love, but his bitter fame, which he poured out to please from blood and tears of bitter pain. And the young folk, when they beat, all is quiet and bliss as in paradise, but see, something stirs amiss. I've envied then for nobody. Look around and you will never find paradise upon this earth, nor indeed in heaven. I will finish with two items. One is A Night in the Wood, which was written by another Georgian poet. Night like a one-eyed giant came with burned clouds on the back. It strewed gray mists and ashes on the forest from a sack. Night brought dark shadows and black roots, made them the mottled camel's feet. And as we walked, night's silken thread embraced our movements fleet. From open mounted gray cliffs, the pine hung o'er with naked knees, like old and gaunt wolves passing by marched on the old oak trees. Beyond the forest is black night, beyond the wood, there is wood. The wood is dark, the ashes gray, the night is black and mute. The world is spacious, small the eye. Let's spread our cloaks somewhere nearby. Glory to all the stars on high, glory to dawn that lights the sky, glory to all the birds that fly, glory to every cry the eagle in gladness sends to nature's breast, and like a little man the sparrow will build its tiny feathered nest. The lark will open wide the door of dove-hued smiling morn, then singing greet the sun and drink the dew with a bill of thorn. Let morning come and wipe away the coal and ashes of the night. Then with an artist, master hand, another picture bring to light. Darkness, light. Now I will finish. I don't know how long. But I wrote this poem. I don't really know whether it's worth a poem, the night of the poem. I sometimes say to myself, it's pure doggerel. But it expresses my feelings when I was in the islands of Tenerife alone. And I sat down, I was working on a project for 18 years that really, at the end of the day, it felt like it should be done anyway. But anyway, I wrote this. And it's, I called it To Dublin With Love. A treatise is that. Treatise is just one person's idea. And it goes like this. I remember, I remember Dublin, innocent and young, when I never knew of Shakespeare, Freud, or that chance or mousey tongue. And though the city was a goldfish bowl compared to where I've been and swam, I still remember the good old times when we lived on bread and jam. I remember, I remember Dublin long ago, frozen slippery front door steps with a snowman a dirty snow. Iced over water troughs, silent sculptured white, where brown and blinkered car torches were a common sight. Lonely green lampposts with like studied desert palms, lined along Pier Street and down to Rings End Strand, the slipway to the station impossible to climb. Sure, the trains aren't running anyway, they have to clear the line. The line to Dunleary that you took to catch the boat and that passed by black rock bats and the frozen 40 foot. 
dirty blackened archways, laundered white again, where the couples did the kissing they were missing. I remember the trips for the fish and chips. Get me a one and one, and the smell of the fish in the sizzly dish. You want salt and vinegar, son? That was the year of the dreadful snow. I think it was 47, when no one left the public house until well past half. I remember, I remember Dublin in the spring when the rain came down in bookfuls and never grew a thing. And the dirt along the gutters that was dry the day before went with Kerry Blues and Woodbines too, pouring down the shore and trying to get the paper from a granny in the snug meant herding across the cobbly street risking me little lug. So Paddy would give me a raspberry drink and me nan her owl flower hug. On the clear days before Easter, the front door brass was polished bright and the little red lamp in the hallway was always kept alight. Black spiked railings with an extra lick of paint and pennies were put in Anthony's box, the loser's favorite saint. Then Westland Row with its altars glow, shrouded in purple mourning, incense smell, sorrowful bells until mass on Easter morning. Then somewhere on high, a choir boy would send solace through the air and the gurriers below, itching to go, whisper their own shy prayers. I remember the gas just after mass when we'd open our Easter eggs, Calgary's milk with a ribbon of silk when my ma went back on the fags. Then were the days that passed in a haze of a gentle April shower and the pubs that opened on Sunday respected the holy hour. I remember I remember autumn in Herbert Park, where naked trees bent shyly because the birds could see their bark. Ducks on stormy waters fattened by Boland's bread and a sign that said, get off the grass or we'll break your bleeding head. Women with prams and reddened hands giving the kids a bit of fresh air. Lonely old dames with fancy names walking their foxskin furs. Nurses keeping their skirts down while battling against the breeze and sometimes blushing shyly because the lad could see their needs. The balls bridge snobs with their stuck up gobs showing off their manicured hands while now and then a black man passed, a student from other lands. Then home again with rosy cheeks on the back of a Guyanese pram and Patrick Dunn's and Boland's mills looking forward to bread and jam. And Hollis Street, where babies were made and delivered in a black leather bag, all paid for by the jumble saves, where the gentry sold their old rags. I remember the little sisters who kept their faces hid. They gave you a colored picture while they smiled behind their grid. And the holy water that you got came from an upturned magic pot. They lived in the chapel on the square. My mother knew the place. I wish I could hear their singing now. I wish I could see her face. I remember, I remember Dublin innocent and young, and I never heard of Shakespeare Freud or that chancer mousy tongue. And though the city was a goldfish bowl compared to where I've been and swam, I still remember the good old times when we lived on bread and jam. Thank you very much. Uh, are we open for questions is, or is it too late? I, I did start late. So how, does, are there any questions? Well, thanks a lot, uh, Dennis, as always. You, you touch our hearts, I, I'm sure, uh, all your, what you said. And, and mainly when you brought to us so openly the mystery of the artist, how you inspired yourself uh, going back to the writings of that past, but at the same time 
to the feelings that are expressed in different um, uh, characters, as you mentioned, casement and the letter, and then other um, from Shakespeare and from different um, artists of the time that you want to represent. And mainly when you brought this project about Camila O'Gorman, that you brought so different characters to inspire yourself to write about it. So that is something that uh, really attracts my attention to know how you have done that. Well, uh, I suppose you have to, you, you have to have it hidden in your subconscious and in your mind, uh, ideas, and that is why it's so important to observe. Uh, you know, I, I enjoy sitting at a railway station looking at people, so you have to be a, an observer. And uh, you have to also be very, you have to show a lot of empathy. Um, and um, they just came in. You know, they came in, and if you're writing yourself a fiction, you know that another voice will come in, even though you've never thought of them. And they will not only come in, but they will barge in, and they will demand their time. And every time you try to stick to the protagonist of your story, this other voice will continue. And that is, I think, an artistic mystery, how they come in, what that is what makes human beings so interesting. Yes, the idea is, I think I must tell you this, we don't come to, a, to an academic conference in order to be helped emotionally but you've helped me. So thank you very, very much. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you. I can only say that. I know that you have a lot of experience as an academic and are very well thought of as an academic and coming from you, I think that is an honor. Thank you. Again, And I would like to thank Oscar Barney Finn for coming along this morning to introduce me. Thank you, Oscar. <laughs>